I've always liked to drive fast. I've always had the desire to win, to take it to the limit. Be better than everyone else. To win, you have to drive the best. That's why I like racing Mercury's. They were made of the right stuff and helped me become a USAC champion. For over 60 years, Mercury's have been synonymous with speed, style, and a winning attitude. And the baddest Mercury of them all is the mighty Marauder, Motor City's ultimate factory hot rod that defined a generation of muscle cars. So get in, buckle up, and hang on, for you're about to take a high-speed history lesson of Mercury at Speed, the legend of Marauder. I remember my first Mercury. It was a red, white, and blue 1963 Monterey S55 Marauder with a monstrous 427 cubic inch engine. It was fast enough and tough enough to take me to victory twice at Pikes Peak along with the 1964 USAC Stock Car Championship. Mercury's have been performance champions on and off the racetrack but that's not the primary reason why Edsel Ford created the original 1939 Mercury. When a guy got to where he could afford something more than a Ford, but he couldn't afford a Lincoln, then he went to General Motors and buy a Oldsmobile or a Buick. If you had a Ford person that was loyal to Ford, then he had a car to go to without going to General Motors or Chrysler Corporation. Development of the big Ford to fill the gap between Fords and Lincolns began in July 1937. Two hand-built Mercury prototypes took only a year to complete. They got a thorough workout on Ford's new Dearborn test track, and later were taken on trial runs throughout the country. Over 104 names had been suggested for the new car. Edsel Ford chose Mercury, which was the name of the winged messenger of the gods in Roman mythology. Mercury was also the god of commerce, who symbolized dependability, eloquence, skill, and speed. Since the Mercury was going to have more horsepower than the Ford, that that sort of fit in with the image they were trying to project with the car. The public was introduced to the first Mercury's on November 4th, 1938. And right from the start, Mercury's have been about style, luxury, throbbing V8 engines, and well, being cool. For years, they were the performance car for people on their way up. And the performance crowd quickly realized that the Mercury's were made of the right stuff to go fast and win. When you had a Mercury, you didn't have to prove it was fast. People knew it was. Hot Rodders installed the powerful Mercury V8 into their roadsters to break countless land speed records at the Bonneville Salt Flats and the California Dry Lake Beds. In 1956, Mercury was flexing its muscle in NASCAR. A dual four-barreled engine right from the factory powered the Tim Flock-driven Mercury Monterey convertible that won the 1957 Daytona Beach Race. While a fuel-injected and aerodynamically modified 57 Mercury, prepared by ace mechanic Bill Strop, went over 159 miles per hour at the 57 Daytona Speed Trials. The kids of Daytona Beach, Florida named it Minnie the Mermaid, and it's stuck ever since then. In just a few short years, the Big M had left its indelible mark in the automotive world. I can go to car shows with one of my cars, and it will have the uh, Mercury emblem in the M. And young people walk by and say, there's the Mercury man. So they know what it is. On April 29, 1948, an all new Mercury was introduced, best known as the James Dean Mercury. The total revised model was a sensation then, and as you're about to see, it still is today. James Dean Mercury of 1949 to 1951 were far from the rebel without a cause. Although they became the symbol of rebellious car crazy teenagers, they were actually aimed at a more conservative car buyer than the earlier Mercury's. The primary role of the 1949 Mercury was to change the Mark's image. It was no longer a glorified Ford, for it was now cruising uptown as an everyman's Lincoln. It had coil springs in the front instead of the the buggy spring or the transverse spring. 
it did not have fenders that looked like they were bolted on. They looked like they were part of the car. It was just a complete break from the past. The 49 Mercury was an instant success as model year production was over three times higher than the company had ever achieved. And when Hollywood heartthrob James Dean drove a jet black 49 coupe in Rebel Without a Cause, the sinfully slinky and streamlined Mercury instantly became the icon to the baby boom generation, a symbol of youth and rebellion. The timelessly styled 49 through 51 Mercuries quickly became the beloved car of choice for automotive customizers and still remains a favorite of street rotters today. When the 49 Merc first came out, it had a certain peeling design. It had sculpture. It had different design concepts, curves, impressions. And that's why it became the inspiration for customizers like ourselves. The swinging 60s brought the Comet, Cyclone, and the Cougar, stylish muscle cars that kept Mercury a step ahead of the competition. I felt that the Mercury Cougar, especially the XR7, had the performance of the other vehicles, but it also had a lot more class. There are not a million Cougars out there. They're unique, they're gorgeous. It was just a much greater step above other competition. They have a statement of their own. If the base Cougar or the Jaguar-influenced XR7 wasn't exciting enough for your need for speed, the Eliminator provided plenty of ground-pounding performance. On the Eliminator, they added the hood scoop, the blacked-out trim, uh, the rear wing, uh, the front air dam, rear sway bar, and all the stripes. The engine's a 428 Super Cobra Jet, uh, Ford rated to 335 horsepower, puts out closer to 400 on the dyno. The 60s also saw the triumphant return of Mercury at racetracks throughout the country. In 1967, the Bud Moore prepared Cougars driven by Parnelli Jones and Dan Gurney successfully competed in the Trans Am Series winning five races. Carroll Shelby, you know, was running the Mustangs and, you know, he'd been road racing for a long time and then I come along as a newcomer and then I start out running him with, with the Cougars, you know, that made me feel real good that I could beat the best that was out there. Parnelli and I always had a bit of a rivalry. You know, I think he felt good when he could whip me and uh, I felt good when I could whip him. So it was, uh, we were definitely both up on our game uh, because of that, which is the way you had to be if you're going to do well in the Cougars. On the quarter mile, the 427 single overhead cam powered Cyclone Funny Cars of Dino Don Nicholson and Fast Eddie Sharpman destroyed the competition and rewrote the record books. But it was on the NASCAR Super Speedways where Mercury had its greatest success. In 1968, Cale Yarrowborough drove the Wood Brothers number 21 Cyclone to victory at the Daytona 500. And then just days later, they repeated their winning ways at Atlanta. Cale Yarbrough was a very hard driver, hard charger. I mean, he drove every lap as hard as he could go. He was probably the only driver that we ever had. If you give an easy signal, he would speed up sometimes. The Mercury that I drove, uh, it more or less handled about everywhere I went. In the capable hands of David Pearson, the number 21 Mercury became a NASCAR legend by visiting Victory Lane over 60 times in just seven years. For some reason, he just had a natural for knowing the right line to take, how to enter the corner, and how to exit the corner. It was so good, and I won so many races with it. I'd say over half of my wins was in a Mercury. Mercury continued its victorious tradition in the 80s when Jack Roush prepared Capri's and Marcour XR4TIs proved to be unbeatable combinations in the Trans Am series by racking up three drivers' championships and four straight manufacturers' titles. Mercury's smashing success on the racetracks had become the stuff legends are made of. Their win-loss ratio was just astounding. The genesis of Mercury's impressive on-track victory for the past 35 years can be traced to its first performance muscle car, the Marauder. When we return, we'll check out the Mercury that I raced into the clouds.
Mercury's long and productive life in the muscle car arena began in 1962 when they stuffed their first high-performance Marauder V8 into a Monterey S55 hardtop. And the rest, as they say, is history. By the early 60s, performance was the name of the game in Detroit. And Mercury certainly wasn't going to be left behind in the dust. They were going to go for the glory, and they were going to play by their own rules. Mercury wanted their own ideas and uh, their own uniqueness in the world of performance, and so they built the Mercury Marauder for that purpose. In 1963, Mercury introduced a mid-year fast-backed model that was inspired by the Marauder convertible concept car that was seen on the auto show circuit. Mercury called the new Monterey Marauder its newest sizzler, and the sleek styling of its new muscle car with a race-inspired roofline spoke loud and clear that this Mercury was going to take no prisoners on or off the track. I think the, the original look of the car, especially when they brought out the 63, the fastback roofline, it gave it a look of sleekness. The fastback body was aerodynamically attractive to stock car racers, which is why it was added as a production model. By offering it to the public, they made the new Marauder legal for racers to use the slick design. They had a model, what was called the Breezeway model, which was a Monterey with uh, a very unique roof line that had a rear window that, that went down. And it was very unique, but it was not very good for racing. So what they decided to do in 1963, when they wanted to go stock car racing, was they took the, the roof structure from a Ford Galaxy Fastback, grafted it to the two-door Monterey, and what they ended up with was the Marauder. The top-of-the-line Marauder was the sporting S55. It was equipped with bucket seats, console, and a floor shifter. Yet if you were looking for the performance of a muscle car that required the practicality of a more conservative and understated automobile, you could still walk into your local Mercury showroom and order a stealth hot rod. For the heart of every Marauder, those powerful big block V8 engines were an option for every full-size Mercury, the Monterey, the Montclair, and even luxurious Park Lane. These cars all weighed over 4,000 pounds, so you needed a big motor in them to get the car rolling. There were four Marauder V8 engines available, the base 250 horsepower, two barrel carbureted 390, a spirited 330 horsepower, four barrel carbureted 390, and a pair of all new NASCAR inspired Super Marauder 427 cubic inch motors, the 410 horsepower version equipped with a single four barrel carburetor, or the dual four barrel carbureted 425 horsepower monster. There was a few of these made with the 427s in them and uh, that's a really desirable motor combination, but they're really hard to find. The automotive press was quick to praise the performance of the new Marauders. In March 1963, Motor Trend wrote that if the performance we've recorded of the least powerful mill is any indication, these new 427 cubic inch engines should make the Monterey a terror. The editors at Mechanics Illustrated also spoke favorably of the new Marauders. Tom McCall had written an article on the Mercury that mentioned it was a great automobile to run back and forth to the post office as long as you didn't twitch the gas pedal too much, you'd end up two states away. Along with the press, the Marauder quickly earned the respect of those who competed in the Stoplight Grand Prix. I did some unsanctioned racing in my younger days and this automobile performed very well. Lost a couple races, I won a lot of them, that's what made it great. Mercury produced the original Marauders from just 1963 to 1965, and they have become some of the most desirable collector cars today. And the legion of faithful Marauder enthusiasts who own them are as special as the cars they treasure. I have a 1963 Mercury Marauder. In that year, they made a little less than 10,000 Marauders, about 9,800 of them. Mine is actually an S55 model. There was only about 2,300 of them made, so they're a pretty rare car. I own a 1964 Mercury Marauder. It was a special order car. I ordered uh, in late 63. It was delivered to me in April of uh, 1964. It has heavy duty police suspension and brakes on it. 390, four barrel carburetor, four speed manual transmission. Other than the new mag wheels that you see on today, the car is pretty much a steel factory original. Right down to the, the radio, the reverberator, the interior, the carpeting is still original. 1969 and 1970 saw the return of the Mercury Marauder. It was now a full-size sport luxury model, and like the original Marauder, the standard V8 was the 390, while an all-new 360-horsepower 429 V8 was optional. 
the new Marauder was the elegant way to go all out. With its classic sleek styling and breathtaking performance, the Marauder easily earned its well-deserved respect on the street. They were really, you know, nice, luxurious cars that had a lot of power and could hold their own against most other competition. They're kind of an automobile that sneaks into the performance era. And almost 40 years later, the performance heritage of the Marauder still shines brightly. They're a great car out on the highway. They're a great car for cruising. I was 21 years old when I bought it. It was a great car for a 21-year-old to have. And to have those memories today is really wonderful. They're definitely a car made for cruising out on the open road. The Mercury Marauder was a stout street performer. But the true test for the performance legend is how it measured up in motorsports competition. When we return, we'll see how the Marauder became the car to beat on racetracks across America. With this NASCAR bred 427 cubic inch engine and its slick aerodynamic styling and of course a pedal to the metal driver like me, the great handling Marauder quickly became the stock car champion and the car to beat. With the release of the sleek new Marauder, Mercury was eager to return to racing again with their first factory-backed effort in six years. With the new body style and plenty of high hopes, Mercury turned to racing geniuses Bill Strop and Bud Moore to prepare the new Marauders for battle for the NASCAR and USAC stock car circuits. Back then, you know, uh, you had to run strictly stock, and uh, it had to be a stock chassis and also a stock body car. We get frames from Mercury, and we may get 20 or 30 at a time. We built the chassis, did strengthening where we needed to strengthen the chassis, then that would go over to another part, and they'd start getting ready to put the body on. We built a little extra strength into the car itself by you with the road cage and stuff that we put in. We did a lot of things that were trademark at the time as far as the exhaust. Through the rocker panels we would cut out and would fit the exhaust system so they were above ground exiting you know, through the rocker panel. The Super Marauder 427 V8 was used in the race cars. The engine featured a single four barrel carburetor on a special lightweight aluminum manifold. With 11.5 to 1 compression, the motor made 410 horsepower. A lot of development work went into that particular car and the motor to, to make it a winner. The Marauder was a winner from the moment the green flag dropped as Little Joe Weatherly won the 1963 NASCAR Grand National Drivers Championship in Bud Moore's number 8 Marauder. It was an awful good balanced race car and uh, it was a good race car for all race tracks and uh, this is what made it so uh, successful being a good race car. Yet the Marauder's greatest on-track success in 1963 and 1964 originated out west from Strop's immaculately prepared red, white and blue Mercuries. My dad was always very patriotic. Red was his favorite color and also blue was his favorite color. That color scheme stuck through the years as being one of our trademarks. And the most successful racing marauder was Strops number 15, driven by one Rufus Parnelli Jones. Boy, there was no car ever showed up anywhere that was better looking or put together than Bill Strops cars. And the cars were always uh, really perfect, the polished. Uh, I mean, you're always really proud to uh, drive one of them. Jones was Strop's kind of race car driver for two reasons. Motivation and determination. If the car was running, you know, it was going to win. There was a little driver and mechanical knowledge, you know, all wrapped into one in Parnelli, where a lot of drivers just show up to the racetrack with a helmet bag and driving shoes, and that's it. Parnelli took a little bit more interest in the setup and preparation of the automobile. Together, they were an unstoppable force, dominating the USAC circuit in 1963 and 64, winning the Stock Car Championship in 64, and at one point in time, capturing seven straight races in the Marauder. I couldn't even believe it myself. Two of the Marauder's most impressive victories came not on the high banks of a super speedway, but on the dangerous twisting turns of Pikes Peak, which Jones won in 1963 and 64. 
It's the most dangerous race course I've ever been on, no question about it. And it's straight off, and there's some places if you went off, they wouldn't even need to come look for you. I mean, they would, you would have absolutely no chance of living. I'd run real hard at the bottom, and then the top half, I'd just make sure I got there. In the celebrated annals of racing, rarely has one car been as successful in such a short period of time as the Mercury Marauder. When it came along, it's time for to switch from Pontiac. We switched to the Mercury, and uh, I'm real glad we did. It was a heck of a good race car. And perhaps Bill Strop understood best why the classic 1963 and 1964 Marauders were such extraordinary automobiles, both on the street and on the track. To him, Mercury was a winner. And, you know, you couldn't tell him that it wasn't. When we come back, an automotive legend makes its return dressed in black. Don't let the fact it has four doors fool you. Under the hood is 300 horsepower of all-American V8 muscle, making the 2003 Mercury Marauder one hot performer. An automotive legend is making its triumphant return to the streets. Inside the heart and soul of the new 2003 Marauder lives the spirit of performance that is Mercury. The 2003 Mercury Marauder. Buckle up for a test drive on speed. 